In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to try and explain how Verdi's choral Ave Maria goes together. To start, let's go through how it came to be. Giuseppe Verdi composed during the golden age of grand opera and is largely known for his contributions to Italian composition following Bellini, Donizetti, and Rossini. Grove Online marks him as the greatest Italian musical dramatist, which I'd say sums it up quite nicely. However, the piece I want to talk about doesn't really fit into Verdi's summary. Whereas the bulk of his output could be described as epic narratives with occasional virtuosic passages throughout, this Ave Maria is short and understated. This is one of four Ave Maria settings done by Verdi, the other three of which are for solo soprano and orchestra. The choral setting in question is grouped into a set of four sacred pieces intuitively titled Quattro Pezzi Sacri. They were published together in 1898, just a few years before Verdi's passing. Although Verdi worked as an organist in a church for a period, his output of religious works doesn't make for a long list. The vast majority of his compositions were operas, and although it could be said that Verdi recognized the effectiveness of Ave Maria as a text, his use of it on four separate occasions probably had little to do with any sacred drive. Now it's time for some honesty. All of this historical information is interesting and all, but it doesn't really get at the heart of what makes this Ave Maria important to me. Having been introduced to this piece in high school, my first impressions were simply that it sounded like a beautiful church hymn. It came as quite a shock upon rehearsing the song how tricky it was to read. In an attempt to answer the question of why something so devilishly difficult could sound so heavenly simple, I attempted to analyze it my sophomore year of college in Harmony 2. From this, I was able to decipher some surface-level details that began to explain what I was hearing. The most apparent aspect of this Ave Maria is how it's written for a standard four-part choir. The tempo is moderate, and the rhythms range from whole notes to eighth notes in common time. In other words, there aren't many notes to sing. A great deal of these slow-moving pitches are stepwise as well. There are two key signatures marked in the piece. It begins with no sharps or flats, and picks up one flat for the second half. The final piece of information, which is immediately apparent, lies just beneath the title. The words Scala Anigmatica Armonizzata, which roughly translate to harmonization of a difficult-to-interpret scale, largely define how the work is structured. The scale sounds like this. and consists of these pitches. Disregarding the final seven measure coda, each of the four pages of this piece is its own section. In each section, one voice sings the Scala Anigmatica up and down in whole notes, with the only change being a lowered fourth degree on the descent. I would liken Verdi's use of the scale to a cantus firmus. This is where the theory becomes a bit more complicated. Because Verdi is not harmonizing over a major or minor scale, harmonic analysis can't be done by the conventional means of finding chords and stating their function in reference to the tonal center. Sure, there are strong implications of C major moving to F major and back to C, which gives the piece a sort of large-scale plagal structure, but almost everything that happens in between those moments must be looked at through a different lens. The first page shows us many of the tricks Verdi uses to ground his solution to the puzzle of harmonizing such an odd scale. However, none of them seem like defined motives initially, because they don't clearly repeat until later in the piece. Before I get into the motivic details, I want to bring attention to the bass voice, which is outlining the scale in whole notes, first up with the F sharp, and then down with the F natural. Now for the fun stuff. The first statement of the words Ave Maria from the soprano displays a contour that returns a couple of times during the first page. The motion here is descending stepwise with a fourth leap up between the third and fourth note. We're going to put a box around it. That is immediately followed by an instance of voice exchange between the soprano and tenor voices, circled here. The next time we see the contour we put a box around is in the tenor voice on the words Dominus Tecum. Here's that fourth jump between the third and fourth note, just to be sure. While this is happening, there are two instances of voice exchange between the tenor and soprano. 
All of this converges during a dynamic swell and culminates with the highest point of the section, the bass at the top of the scale and the soprano on the F-sharp. Things gradually calm down again as the scale descends, but the tenor makes one more statement that appears to be a sort of inverted retrograde of the contour we've been focusing on. You may notice an octave jump to start at this time, but as far as I can tell, octave leaps don't carry much meaning for this piece, except to reset the range the singer is in. So now that the tenor has given us the final motive on Fructus Ventris Tui, we're given a rather unsatisfying cadence from a French augmented sixth chord to C major. To top it off, there's a suspended 4 to 3 motion where we only get the third for a moment before it jumps back up to the fifth. It's closure, but it's pretty weak. On to the second page, where the ideas we've seen so far get dissected a bit and appear slightly clearer than before. Notice now that the alto is in charge of our scale. The interval of import for this page is the fourth. Virtually everything that repeats relies on fourth motion, and I've color-coded the different ways it's used. The purple shows the stepwise descent, the pink shows the stepwise ascent, the blue shows the downward leap, and the green shows the upward leap. There are a couple of fifth jumps from C to F towards the end which prepare us for the upcoming key change, and I marked these in dark red, but the driving force between this page is fourth motion. The closure to C major is even less satisfying this time with the fourth suspension in the soprano and a flat sixth in the tenor for two beats before getting the fifth. With the third page, the scale begins on F in the tenor voice, and the bass picks up on that fourth motion we saw on the previous page. In fact, we have a number of fourths throughout the third page. This time, however, there's a new color on the page. I've labeled all third motion with orange to simplify what is a rather busy page. In the second and third measure of this section, we get a focus on A, C, and E, which creates a pretty definitive sounding A minor, and is the first instance of such a strong chord lasting this long. Then, we see what looks like a pretty standard motive in the soprano voice, where it jumps up a fourth and steps down a third a few times. You can see that the bass is doing something similar in contrary motion beneath it. To close the section, the soprano slowly steps down a third, and the bass goes up a fourth from C to F. I mean, that's practically cadential. The final page, begins with a definitive F major chord. This is notably different from the two middle pages, which start out with a single voice and then grow polyphonically. More than that, the first three measures seem to land on recognizable chords that make sense together. Alas, nothing is clearly tonicized and harmonic motion speeds up again. In the fifth measure, I've marked the alto line because it almost looks like ornamentation circling the F sharp. We get a bit of 3rd, 4th, and 5th motion like we've seen already, but not much. It's worth noting that the bass line is almost all stepwise now. The first system descends, and the second ascends until a 7th leap down where things start to move towards something like a cadence. Peculiarly, with all the nearly functional harmony on the 3rd page, the section closes rather disappointingly on a B-flat major chord. However. Verity hasn't made his final statement yet. After a measure of rest and a return to the original key signature, we get a coda that has a strong chord every measure, with the only exceptions being a few suspensions. After all of the confusing harmonic language and hidden motivic ideas, the Ave Maria closes on a 5-7 to 1 in C major, our home key. Throughout this choral work, Verdi uses tools like voice exchange, imitation, and cantus firmus to reference rules exemplified by Palestrina, another legend in Italian composition. The reason this Ave Maria sounds so beautiful comes from the employment of such Renaissance techniques and their gradual motion to more traditional tonicization. It occurred to me that this piece begins with trouble finding any strong tonality and gradually works through conflict by finding convention and using more harmonically predictable techniques. I see the first page as an exposition of sorts, hinting at how the piece will unfold. The middle pages act as a development that takes those ideas and expands on them. The last page is a culmination that manages to find strong harmonic structure 
and finally gives us a sense of closure 